Good morning. Thank you so much for being invited by the Museo Nacional del Prado. I feel very honored to be invited. And it's a pleasure for me to speak to you on Michalina Voce. While the name of Artemisia Gentileschi is familiar to most art historians, probably few will have heard of Michalina. Michalina Voce left few paintings, no more than about 30, half of which are signed with her full name. Her dated works are situated between 1643 and 1659, and are marked by technical virtuosity, variety of genres, original iconography, astonishing sensibility, and are from small to huge format. Their variety is impressive, ranging from portraits, I just show some examples, flower garlands, genre scenes, and depictions of saints, to a couple of monumental history paintings. All of these works make a powerful impression in terms of format, technique, and highly individual iconography, as I said. It is clear that Michalina Davis avant-garde images with great daring. In pictorial terms, her oeuvre is uncommonly attractive and sensitive, and lyrical style for her literal, I'm sorry, for her lyrical style beguiling. The most exceptional painting focused on later in this lecture is without a doubt her triumph of Bacchus in the Kunstisocius Museum in Vienna. Measuring nearly three by four meters, the canvas is not worthy for its depiction of the life-size male nudes of all ages. Surprisingly, the artist included her self-portrait in this entirely profane composition, as you see here, in which she appears semi-nude following the God of Wine. The painting, which expresses the artist's technical brilliance and intellectual audacity in every detail, constitutes an absolute unique phenomenon in European tradition of women artists. As far as is known, Michalina Bocce's life was free of the adversity and hardship so common in the biographies of most female artists. Already in 2012, Gina Strunwasser celebrated women, women, I quote, who met the challenge of being female professionals and succeeded as artists at a time when such accomplishments were not expected or encouraged. End of quote. In the self-portrait Michalina painted, she radiates confidence and ambition. She is enthroned next to her easel and has led in a portrait in that colouring. Her attention to many details, for instance, the palette, the textiles of her costume, her bosom, the lace color, as well as the extraordinary timepiece with the pink ribbon exemplify her power of observation. More than anyone else, she herself was convinced that she succeeded as an artist. In this respect, the historical account of Wautier's life and work can serve as a complement to Strumwasser's gallery of women and represents a challenge to uncover the story of her life. Four research questions are to be considered here. First, to what extent is Michalina part of the tradition of women artists? Second, who was Michalina? What kind of sources are available to reconstruct her biography? In what way did, milieus, did the milieu in which Michalina was grown up make it possible for her to develop in such a remarkable way? Third, in which way did her oeuvre evolve and might there be a chance 
that her oeuvre reflects her biography. Fourth and last, did she have access to the court of Leopold Wilhelm? And if so, what did this entourage signify for her? Let's start with the first question. To what extent is Michalina part of the tradition of women artists in the Netherlands? Literary sources such as Albrecht Dürer's journal of 1521 and Giugiardini's Descriptioni of the Low Countries of 1567 testify of different forms of female artists in the Netherlands. Both of the authors, Dürer as well as Giugiardini, resided in the southern Netherlands and therefore could be seen as contemporary witnesses of the activities of women artists. During his stay in the Netherlands in 1522, the German artist Albrecht Dürer met not only the humanist Erasmus, for example, but also the illuminator Gerard Horenbout. He was living in Kent. In his diary, he noted that this illuminist, the painter, had a daughter. She was around 18 years old. Her name was Susanna, and she had made a small painting representing Christ as a salvator. And Dürer remarks, I had to pay one gilder for this little painting. And he adds, and this is very important, it is really a wonder that a painting made by a woman is so expensive. The second author, Lodovico Giugiardini, the Italian author who published the Descrizioni di Tutti by Sibassi in the 16th century, claimed that it was typical for the Netherlands that quite a lot of women were practicing the arts. I'm very pleased that Letizia already yesterday talked about him using sources such as Giugiardini. Giugiardini refers to some contemporary female artists, such as Levina Teerling, an illuminator from Bruges, who lived as a painter at the Tudor court in the service of Elizabeth I and Henry VIII. And he also refers to Maria Bessemers. She has been important because she was the mother-in-law of Peter Bruegel the Elder. Peter Bruegel the Elder died when his two sons were very young, respectively six and four years old. And Maria Bessemers, their grandmother, was a painter of watercolors and educated her two grandsons. It was thanks to her that Jan Bruegel the Elder became a painter of exclusive flower still lifes. Katharina van Hemessen, we heard her name yesterday, daughter of a painter, um, was living near Antwerp. Mary of Hungary, Hungary appreciated her so much that she invited her and her husband, a musician, to join her at the Spanish court. Hardly any work by the third mentioned Levina Teerlink can be attributed with certainty. No works have been preserved painted by Maria Bessemers, but there are some signed paintings by Katharina van Hemessen. You saw also these paintings yesterday, of which her self-portrait of 1548 is the most innovative. You see it here at the right. The pose is based on examples from 15th century manuscript illumination, where texts by Pliny the Elder or Boccaccio were accompanied by images of women painting their own likenesses, as you see here at your left. No other early modern woman artist had defined her character through the medium of a self-portrait as assertively as Artemisia Gentileschi. In the most expressive one, she appears herself, she appears as an allegory of painting and shows her pose dramatically across the picture plane and wielding her brush with her right hand while holding her palette and brushes in her left hand. Compared to Artemisia Gentileschi, Michalina's pose is, 
I do agree, rather static and more prudish, but it evinces a very personal ambition. It is not known which were the actual sources from which Michalina drew the inspiration for her own self-portrait, but the inventive self-portrait of Antonio Moro, working also in Madrid for a long time, dating from 1558, about a century earlier, can be likened to hers. Now we are coming to the second research question. Who was Michalina? What kind of sources are available to reconstruct her biography? In what way did Trottier's milieu, her entourage, make it possible to her to develop in such a remarkable fashion as a woman and as an artist? In analyzing Michalina's entourage, a distinction is made between the milieu in which she was raised and the one that afforded her opportunities to develop her talent as a painter. Michaelina was born in 1614 in Mons, a city approximately 37 miles southwest of Brussels, into a prominent family. Her father, Charles Le Vautier, had been a page to the Marquis de Fuentes, Viceroy of Naples, and bore the newly noble title of Seigneur de Am sur Eure. Her mother came from a patrician Bergen family of some standing. Charles Vautier had three sons and two daughters from his first marriage, and five sons and one daughter from his second. Michalina was born in the second marriage. Michalina's father died when she was just three years old. As there are no indications that her mother remarried, we may assume that Michalina grew up in a house without a father. However, she was surrounded by her five brothers and three half-brothers. The two sisters, half-sisters, died at a young age. In the year of their father's death, the eight siblings were between one and 23 years old. That ambition ran high in the family is evidenced by the offices two of her brothers later held. Jacques Vautier, Michalina's eldest brother, became Archier de Corps de Sa Majesté and settled in Madrid for decades. Pierre Vautier became Roi d'Arme of His Majesty, Philip IV, and spent his entire life in Brussels. Her brother Charles, who would also become a painter, just as his sister, was five years her senior. What was the significance of her brother and artist Charles? What do we know about Charles Vautier's career? And where and when did he receive his training? All we know is that he left Mons for Brussels around 1633 and was living in Brussels in 1642 and worked there as a painter without having registered as a master in the guild. He only registered as a master in the Brussels guild eight years later, in 1651, only at the age of 42. In the registration, in the entry, in let's say, in the book of the registrations of the masters, reference is made to his origin. Born in Bergen, in the Netherlands, and in the margin is noted that Monsieur Vautier was trained abroad. He was trained in the Buitenland, where exactly Charles received his artistic education is not known, but given the tradition of young painters to travel to Italy and the family's familiarity with that country, because their father had served there, that is probably where he trained. That Michalina would have followed him south to Italy is less likely, if not outright impossible. It is more plausible that she went to live with her brother in Brussels in the period 
3842. Their mother died in 1638, and this date serves as a terminus postquem for their move to Brussels. Let us return to the initial question. Where did Michalina develop her technical expertise? In light of the family situation, we can assume that she shared a workshop with her five-year-older brother, Charles. That Charles could bypass the rules of the Brussels Painters Guild is not evident. It is striking that in the registration, he is called Monsieur Vautier, and without mentioning of his given name, which was really exceptional in the Brussels Guild list. We must conclude that he enjoyed some unique standing, which can only be explained by his ties with prominent patrons or members of the card in Brussels. Recently, more archival evidence was discovered. No less than seven last wills of Charles could be retraced in the Brussels Royal Archives. He designated his nephew, Augustin Charles, son of one of his brothers, as his sole heir. In one of the eight testaments by Charles Bautier, there is even a reference to a last will written by his sister, Michalina Bautier, on the 17th of March, 1662. This record would have been a unique source to get to know her better. There is no such thing as a testament because it reflects one's properties and, even far more important, reveals family ties as well as emotional networks. But fate has been unrelenting for her. I was even crying in the archives in Brussels. The deeds of her notary didn't survive. So no trace of Michalina there. In the Bustles district records, some very interesting facts arose. In 1668, Michalina and Charles purchased a large house near the Église de la Chapelle in Brussels together. Here you see a map of Brussels of the mid of the 18th century on which has been educated the Église de la Chapelle. This document confirms that, married, that the unmarried brother and sister lived at the same house. You see here the choir of the church as seen from the house in which Charles and Michalina were living opposite the streets. It's only a distance of about eight meters. So let's summarize. What do we know about the relation between brother and sister Vautier? Charles moved from Mons to Brussels around 1633, and Michalina followed him, probably around 1640. Both of them were unmarried, never had children, and shared their passion for painting. The two of them shared a home and presumably also a studio. Was Michalina initiated into the art of painting by her brother? We will discuss this point later. The dated paintings by Charles Vautier are made between 52 and 1685. The dated paintings by Michalina are made between 1646 and 1659. There is a remarkable stylistic resemblance in so far between the work of the brother and the sister, in so far that it is hard to distinguish the paintings from Michalina from those by her brother, although her paintings are more refined and more sensitive. And happily, there are significant differences between their signatures. Look, for example, at the two signatures illuminated here. I also show two paintings by her brother, Charles Vautier, but dating from the period 
about 10 years later that Michalina started her painting career. Another painting by her brother, Charles Vautier. Now we are coming to our third research question. In which way did Michalina's oeuvre evolve? And might there be a chance that her oeuvre reflects her biography? Her stylistic evolution has to be investigated on the basis of one engraving and her dated paintings. In order to introduce you to her work and to let appreciate you the diversity of her paintings, I will show you an overview of her work. And I tried to separate some four periods. So let's have a look at her work. Let's start with the first period, covering the years from about 43 to 49. You've seen already the engraving of Cantelmo, Andrea Cantelmo. He was a very important general in the army of the Spanish king. And he is extremely important, let's say this engraving is extremely important because the painted portrait has not been preserved. But in the left corner of this engraving, there is a reference to Michalina Vautier, who has painted the original. I hope you can read it here. Michalina Wautiers. Wautiers is, let's say, a second name. It's a, a, a name a bit different. In fact, a Flemish variation of the French name Wautier pinks it. So you see that she was the painter of, initially the painter of this portrait of Cantelmo. This general we are going to discuss later on too. I also show you the portrait of an officer dated 1646. I hope it's clear already that we only know, let's say from a technical point of view, perfect paintings by Michalina. The first history painting she ever made was this marriage of St. Catherine. It was hidden in a cloister in Namur, where it was detected by a colleague from Brussels. And in order to show it in the retrospective exhibition we organized in 2018 in Antwerp, I will discuss this exhibition also uh, later, it has been cleaned. It was very, very dirty because no one, no one has ever looked after the painting. And thanks to the, uh, the financing of the uh, King Baudouin's foundation in Brussels, it has been restored in order to have it shown in the exhibition in a new way. When you're coming to the second period in the oeuvre of Michalina, I want to refer to a series of the five senses painted by her. They are fully signed and dated 1615. In the context of the exhibition, we were trying to detect these five paintings. We felt ourselves as a kind of Sherlock Holmes, looking for the lost paintings. We only knew, let's say, the, the view of the painting thanks to a very bad black and white reproduction in an auction catalog of 1975. We launched really um, some, some activities on the radio and on the television in order to ask for information in relation to these five uh, paintings representing the five senses. I just show you what we try to do. The exhibition was organized by the Rubens House, but held, was held in the Mass Museum, one of maybe the largest modern museum in the city of Antwerp. And we were really trying to detect these five paintings because they were so important within the context of her oeuvre. And what happened? In 2019, 
I came across a cycle of copies after the five senses by Michalina. They were preserved in the Brussels private collection. So from this moment onwards, we were pleased because we knew how they looked. However, we had to wait until last year when at an evening I got a phone call from the director of Christie's in London telling me, you are not going to believe this. Do you know what? I'm looking at this moment at the original five senses of Michalina Vautier. It has been a wonder that they could be retraced. And because they have been so important, they have been acquired by the very famous couple Egg and Rosemarie van Otterlo, a Dutch couple, real Messinas living in Boston in the United States, but Dutch of origin. And they are founded recently a center for Netherlands art as a part of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And they acquired the five senses by Michalina Voce to be exposed in the new museum. On the 5th of October, they will be exhibited for the first time. And on that occasion, they will be given a lecture on Michalina Vautier by me to introduce her talent and eccentricity. Do remember, this cycle of five senses was dated 1650. When we are going through her work, we come now to this remarkable garland of flowers. It is very exceptional that a painter paints, for example, history paintings and also genre pieces, and at the same time, flower still lives. This is uncommon, unseen even within the works of male contemporary artists. And aside from this, this garland is also loaded with an extra dimension of vanity. When you have really good eyes, you can see that here, on the left and also at the right, I hope you can see it, that there are no flowers to be seen, but bucrania. And bucrania, these are skulls of oxes. Maybe you can see it better now in this detail. So the garland has been uh, hanged down, fixed onto the two skulls of the oxes. And of course, skulls always refer to the category of vanity. The flowers will be gone next week, and the skulls are already a reference to the, uh, the disappearance of this beautiful bouquet of flowers. The interesting thing is that Michalina copied these oxes from Rilievos at the Aira Parques in Rome. So this is really surprising because it might be an indication that she traveled to Rome together with her brother, but I think it's going too far maybe. I think we better presume that she used some engravings. We know that already in the beginning of the 17th century, relie the relievos of the Arapakes from Rome were engraved, and I presume that she used some engravings. Coming to the next period in her oeuvre, I show you this painting. It's in fact some kind of a sketch preserved in the Royal Museum in Antwerp. So it's not really a genre piece, it's not a real portrait, but it's yeah, a sketch. She was just trying to exercise her hand. One of the most important paintings ever made by Michalina is this portrait of a Jesuit. As you can see, it's a very impressive portrait and uh, it's also a very impressive personality. The painting is fully signed and dated 1654. 
And we know that the sitter is an Italian Jesuit. He was the most important Jesuit in the 17th century. And he knew also the Archduke Leopold Wilhelm, about whom I will um, discuss later, because he was looking for money to organize his missionary activities into China. Now, it's an interesting example, and this case tells a lot about the way in which Michalina Voce is now conquering the world, speaking from a financial point of view. When you look at this painting, there is this reference to an auction in Zurich. It was auctioned there in 2017, and it had an estimation of around 70,000 euros. Look at this, it was sold for nearly 500,000 euros, and in second instance, it was sold to the Clash Collection in London for around 1 million euros. And I'm not interested in the money itself, but I'm interested in the fact that Michalina is becoming more and more expensive. Why? Because from the moment the works made by women artists have become very expensive, it's an indication that they are taken seriously. And that's what is happening with Michalina at this moment. To illustrate the force of her talent, I show you the portrait by Michalina in comparison with a contemporary portrait of the same man. So you see, when you confront these two portraits, it's something completely different. Michalina is the genius, and the other painter, an anonymous painter from the 17th century, is just someone who tried to register some kind of schedule. I felt very pleased yesterday when Letizia showed us also this painting. It's one of the most attractive and beautiful paintings Michalina ever made. It's datable around 55, and I have to admit that it is not signed nor dated, but it fits so well into the uh, oeuvre of Michalina that no one doubts at this moment the attribution. Just to let you enjoy the quality of her paintings, I'll show you some details. Just look at it. It's better that I'm not comment on this. These details refer to the sensibility of her execution. There's always a kind of melancholy. And we know already that she was a perfect painter of flower garlands. You see here, for example, in the foreground, this basket with fruit and flowers, another indication of her talent of registration. To show that we, were, we are also trying to, to study her paintings in depth, I show you this detail because we tried with the help of macro X or F techniques, scanning techniques, to see, to retrace, in fact, what the original colors might have been of this painting. And when you look at this detail, yeah, this is St. Agnes with the lamp just in front of her. Uh, on the basis of the scanning, we presume that the paintings might have been more intensive. And we also presume that the clothes of this little girl, the costume, were initially much more blue than we can see it uh, now. So this is just a reconstruction of what uh, possibly may have been seen in the mid of the 17th century. I also talked about a saint, representation of a saint. Michalina is never representing saints in a traditional way. Look at him, for example. He's very individualized. And I presume that she was taking just painting just from life and took a real man as a starting point for this composition. 
I showed you already another genre scene, the genre scenes representing the five senses of these five young boys. Here you have another example of her genre talent. Two young boys with uh, while bubbling uh, bubbles. And the bubble is, of course, something that doesn't exist for a long time, just a fraction of a second. And this is, again, a reference to vanity. Here you see detail of the two boys, also registered very realistically. Then we are coming to the last phase of her oeuvre, when she made impressive, huge religious scenes, such as this one, dated 46. When you look at some details of the faces, I hope you recognize the style we've detected in the two uh, little saints. Look, for example, also, I will go back with one slide, to the differences by which she indicated uh, age. Here you have this young Mary, and here you see Mother Anna. This painting is fully signed and dated. Maybe you can read it. It's, it's always a bit difficult to read her name, but trust me, there's an indication. Michalina Wautier, Invenit et Fekit, 1656. The largest religious history painting she painted is this one, an Annunciation. This painting is also fully signed and dated. I'll show you some details from which it becomes clear how she rendered textiles, always looking at some extra details. Look, for example, at the ribbon. Compare this face with the detailed faces we have already seen. She had an interest in the rendering of textiles. For example, the rendering of this Turkish tapestry, from which it becomes evident that she also could work very sketchy, just in order to render the, the, uh, the quality of the carpet. Here you see some detail of the right foot of the angel approaching Mary. In the same, at the same time, in the middle of the 60s of the 17th century, she painted very, very impressive portraits of men. In fact, she painted far more portraits of men than she painted portraits of women. And again, we see that this is an officer, someone from the army. Returning now to our third question. In which way did her oeuvre evolve? And has there been a chance that her oeuvre, could we have the proof that her oeuvre reflects her uh, biography? In fact, we do not know too much. She left Mons, probably moved into the house of her brother, probably they used the same studio, and as far as know, Michalina has only been active during a period of about 16 years. In 1668, they purchased together this large house in the center of Brussels. But we don't know if she was still active as a painter in 1668, because her last dated works are dated 1659. In fact, very little biographical information can be distracted from her artistic work, unless the fact that she must have been active and extremely diligent between her 29th and 45th year. Nothing is known, nothing is known for sure, I would say, about her training. And so far, 
we do not even know if she worked as an amateur or as a professional artist who was paid for her labor. As has become clear, it was hard to make a connection between the artist's life and her work. Luckily, there's one trace left that hasn't, in, hasn't yet, I'm sorry, been investigated and that will prove to be important. Did she have access to the court of the Archduke Leopold Wilhelm? You see her portrait of this Archduke painted by Peter Theist. Did Charles Vautier, her brother, maintain effective contacts with the Habsburg court? And if so, to which channels did his younger sister, Michalina, have contacts with the court? And if so, to which channels? This double question illustrates again how difficult it is to disangle the career of the brother and the sister. Charles was five years older than his sister, and archival research made it clear that they, both unwed, spent properly their entire lives under the same roof. Because it was easier for young men with financial means to travel and train as a painter than it was for a young woman, Charles conceivably told his sister himself and possibly brokered patrons for her. Charles operated independently from the very beginning of his séjour in Brussels. In 1642, after all, he was cautioned by the Painters Guild for making paintings in Brussels as a stranger without being a member of the Guild or an official inhabitant of the city. This could only be possible because he worked for high place patrons out of touch with local guilds. While it is extremely difficult to establish a chronology of Charles Vautier's oeuvre, an analysis of his paintings make it clear that he specialized in portraits of nobles, noble men, painted primarily in the 1660s. Relatively few painted portraits by him have survived, but scores of portraits, of portrait engravings, I'm sorry, refer to him as the painter of the original painted portrait, possibly now lost. His sitters included, for example, Charles Albert de Longueval and Antonio Pimentel de Prado, members of the highest elite eager to be seen at the Habsburg court in Brussels. The most important work by Charles from his early portrait, from his early period, I'm sorry, is an impressive full-length portrait of the Archduke, now in the Czech Republic. This portrait, however, is not listed, listed in the Archduke 1659 inventory. I will come back on this. And this is exactly why one must wonder if it was directly commissioned by the Archduke and thus done from life. Not infrequently, portraits of rulers were made on the basis of prototypes by other artists known via engravings. Leopold Wilhelm was fond of his own likeness, as emerges from the fact that David Teniers II, as well as Jan van den Hoeke, made his portrait. It is possible, but by no means certain, that Leopold Wilhelm, the Archduke, and Charles Vautier, the brother of Michalena, actually met. As mentioned earlier, the Archduke did not own a single work by the Archduke, I'm sorry, did not own a single work by Charles when he left Brussels to take up residence again in Vienna. What do we know about the connection between the Archduke Leopold Wilhelm and Michalina Vautier? Michalina's earliest known work, I showed it already, a copper engraving after a no longer excellent portrait of Andreas Cantelmo. This Italian general achieved a series of military successes for Spain. In 1632, he came to the southern Netherlands to defend the city of Maastricht. And in 1643, he led the Battle of Roqua as a maître de camp general. He was famed as a fierce general 
and was also a humanistically minded art lover. For instance, he ordered a series of tapestries depicting the seven liberal arts from the atelier of the Antwerp painter Cornelis Schut. The engraving, we are now turning back to the portrait of Cantelmo, bears the unmistakable inscription Michalina Wautiers Pinksit. It is a magisterial portrait that superbly captures the psychology of the art lover. Wautier also did more by lavishing attention, I will go back maybe for a moment, on this slender figure. She represented the armored Cantelmo, half length, his back hollow, and in his right hand, a staff of command. His left arm is akimbo, and his gloved fingers elegantly fan outwards. The confusion of battle is depicted in the background. Account should be taken of the fact that the inscription and the military scenes were provided by the engraver at Cantelmo's request, I suppose. No such additions are found in any other painting by Michalina Bautier. What is surprising is that the 29 years old Michalina had the opportunity at the very beginning of her career to portray one of the most important generals of her time. That an art lover like Cantelmo, who certainly had the means to engage any portrait he wished for, chose to have himself limed by an, at that time, unknown woman. This is anything but usual. She must have had help, or was he impressed by the fact that she was both a woman and highly talented? That we do not know how Michalina met Cantelmo, however, does not rule out that Michalina met new patrons via Cantelmo. Cantelmo died in 44. Two years later, Michalina again seized the opportunity to portray a commander in the Spanish army. This bus portrait is fully signed and dated. The sitter's identity is not known, but the pink sash diagonally across the shoulder and over a buff coat suggests he held military office. He is portrayed as a powerful personality, three-quarter length facing less, aiming a self-aware gaze at the viewer. Once again, we have a portrait of a high-ranking Spanish officer. The latter portrait is yet again conclusive evidence of her contacts with the highest military echelons. Whether and how the semi-aristocratic Michalina Bautier was acquainted with or part of this elite milieu of the Brussels count court, I'm sorry, cannot be established. That she was nonetheless known by people in this decree emerges from a very surprising source. Courtiers in Brussels were expected to, to be accomplished dancers. Therefore, an excellent French dancing master was attached to the court. Himself a dancer, Adam Pierre de la Grenée, a maître de ballet, entered Leopold Wilhelm's service in 1649. His journal is kept in the Brussels archives. In it, he records the names of the people he instructed. From this exceptional source, we can form an image of the diversity of his clientele including the son of the King of Denmark, the Prince of Arenberg, the daughter of the Marcus of Caracena, and many others. It seems he taught the entire beau monde of Brussels to dance. The dancing master also collected paintings by 16th and 17th century Flemish masters. At the back of his journal, he painstakingly registered the names of the artists from whom he bought paintings. He also noted the subjects and the prices. And so on the 17th of January, 1650, he wrote that he had bought three paintings by Mademoiselle Bautier, a depiction of a Bacchus, a likeness, he only designated as a portrait, and a Nicodemus. Of primary importance is that he was active in the very heart of the court in Brussels, and that he knew this dancing master, and that he knew, I'm sorry, Mademoiselle de Bautier very 
Well, I'm sorry. In 1647, Archduke Leopold Wilhelm of Austria, brother of the Emperor Ferdinand III, had become acting governor of the Netherlands. Prior to this appointment, he was already a fanatic collector. During his stay in Brussels, he assembled a collection of close to 1,400 paintings. David Teniers II, from 1651 on, Pinto de Camera, court painter, played an important role in forming this collection. We know that it was thanks to him that the detailed inventory was compiled in 1659. The inventory affords the final piece of the information on Vautier. Without the description of some of her works in this, I'm sorry, in this archducal collection, it would have been impossible to rescue the artist Michalina Vautier from oblivion. Although Vautier had been, I'm sorry, although Vautier had found favor with a few noble patrons even before the arrival of the archduke we may assume that the artistic-minded Archduke made her into who she became. The, question, the works in question are three depictions of saints and one mythological scene. The first identification is the most extensive, a painting of Saint Joseph, Saint Joachim. You see here the, the painting reproduced and its reading listed in the inventory as an original by Miss Magdalena Wautiers from Mons or Bergen in the Netherlands. The half-length depiction of this Saint Joseph is also the second one an original by Miss Michalina Wautier. The largest work is described as, again, as some details from the Saint Joseph. The last painting is this triumph of Bacchus. This information from the inventory is of great importance because of the nature of the description in the inventory. There's a reference to Michalina Vautier as the artist who made this triumph of Bacchus. Without this preliminary knowledge, it would be impossible to understand the genesis and the iconography of this monumental canvas. Only in the Brussels of around 1650, in the immediate surroundings of the artistic court of the Archduke, it has been possible for a talented, unmarried woman to launch a groundbreaking experiment on, of this magnitude. Reading about the payments to Michalina Vautier in the journal kept by the dancing master, on the base of this, one has the impression that he purchased rather than commissioned the works of art from her. So he just made a note, I acquired a Bacchus from Michalina. If Michalina worked for the free market, where did she offer her paintings? Did she receive potential clients in her house? Did she have the opportunity to show her pictures elsewhere? The fact that the Brussels Painters Guild never called her to account for herself, as it did her brother Charles, suggests that she in any case must have worked behind the scenes and therefore was not perceived as a competing painter in the court capital. She practiced all genres and therefore could appeal to a broad target group and anticipate the elite's changing taste. The canvas of the Triumph of Bacchus would have filled a big room and required a labor-intensive and precise work. The subject, Triumph of Bacchus, incidentally, is so specific that not every patron would have wanted it. And it is unlikely that Michalina devised such a concept on, their own, on her own initiative. 
when looking at this painting, it makes more sense that she was commissioned to paint a monumental composition of this size. Because the painting was inventorized in Leopold Wilhelm's collection in Vienna in 1659, it seems logical to assume that he granted her the commission. The Habsburg Archduke is always presented as a paragon of devotion and religiosity, but he was also a fervent art collector. When we look at this collection, it consisted for one third out of religious paintings, but this implies that two thirds of the collection depicted profane scenes. His interest in Italian and Flemish painting meant that mythological themes were abundantly represented. Upon his return to Vienna, Maarten van Heemskerk's painting, Becker's triumphant return from India to Greece of about 1537, had by then also entered in the collection of the artist, of the Archduke. If during his sojourn in Brussels, Leopold Wilhelm engaged Magdalena to paint a back scene, one wonders whether and to what extent she was given explicit instructions. Perhaps David Tenier II served as an intermediary. He surely will have wanted to fulfill the patron's expectations and taken pains to inform Wautier as well as possible. In the 1659 inventory, the painting is described as a large piece of oil paint on canvas of the triumph of Bacchus. Was the commission described as such? So does it imply that the archduke told Michalina you should make something like that? Or was it actually made coming from her own initiative? It remains a mystery. But we have to wonder if Michalina made make a sketch. Was it an external prototype that she used? Could the artist herself decide how to work up the composition? One thing is clear. What she is painting is astonishingly original, obliging us to believe that Leopold Willem had faith in her art and therefore gave her free reign to a certain extent. In analyzing the scene, I examine how she interpreted various layers of meaning. Who is portrayed, i show you some details, where and how. What were her sources? What gender relationships arose? What direction does the narrative take by integrating a self-portrait? The composition is dominated by 10 life-size figures, as you can see. Almost, almost all the figures face left, creating the impression that the retinue is in motion. So they are all looking to the left. On the far left, a gray-haired man pulls the wheelbarrow forward with a double rope. Six children disport themselves walking with the procession. Tracks are visible in the ground. A dog is burning in the left foreground and the hilly landscape is visible in the distance. Except from the woman on the far right, none of the personages look out at the future. It is striking that no point of reference can be found for Michalina's composition. Scores of representatives of the 16th and the 17th century Italian and Southern Netherlands school portrayed the theme of the god of the wine and his retinue, but opted for a different composition for the procession and the setting. Just show some examples. You see a detail of one of the children. And here, of Michalina herself. She was primarily innovative in the rendering of the atypical Silenus walking near his donkey and pushing Bacchus in the wagon. However, she was truly avant-garde in the inclusion of herself as the external beholder. For the sake of this novel, 
this novel form of self-presence, Vautier thus also had to devise a new pictorial language. She derived inspiration from antique sculpture of Bacchantes, standing in contraposto. I'll just show you some antique examples. And we know already that she was familiar with antiquity because she included these oxes into her garland of flowers. We also have the confirmation that Michalina painted or drew after antique sculptures. There is a drawing by her hand of an ancient modello of a Nike, you see here. Familiarity with the classical tradition was highly exceptional for female artists and therefore undoubtedly contributed to her positive self-image. I show you also the signature of Michalina. It's written on the versal side of this uh, drawing. Next to this, she was inspired by 17th century emblematic books, such as Cesare Ripa's Iconologia, the children beside Michalina's alter ego in the painting are playing with a billy goat, an animal traditionally regarded as a symbol of lust. The portraits of military commanders mentioned earlier illustrate that the artist could render clothed male nudes like no other. But then, in the triumph of Bacchus, she suddenly painted nude men, a picture populated by almost 11 completely nude men. It is though she wanted to do away with the old chestnut that women were incapable of rendering male corporality. Essentially, there were no contemporary female artists who had been given the opportunity to draw living male nudes. Even well into the late 19th century, debates raged in the Brussels City Council about whether women could be admitted to the academy to draw models from life. Wautier's statement is thus clear. In this picture, she demonstrates that she has seen so many nude male bodies that she can register in great detail them. Given that she grew up with eight brothers, surely she was amply exposed to the bodies of young men. For the procession, she empathically selected men of different ages, with various skin tones and from all weight classes. Young boys, too, and live in the scene with their unrestrained gesticulation, as you see here. In this way, the painters generates an inversion whereby she, a woman, directs the cortege. I have already said that the artist included her self-portrait. The woman on the far right stands still next to the wheelbarrow and looks straight ahead. With the exception of the woman with the castanets, see here, who is vaguely painted in the background, no other female is part of this company. Michalina does not follow the triumphal procession, but has distanced herself from it by turning towards the viewer. She is looking at you. Moreover, she ignores the lustful, offensive man next to her. He tries in vain to touch her and draw her attention. Her protagonists move forward. They follow the rhythm of the procession of which the young, drunken Bacchus forms the center. He cannot get enough of the grape juice a satyr pours into his mouth. His round belly under the tiger skin draws all attention. Furthermore, the composition is perfectly balanced. The lower part of the vine god's body, covered by a grape leaf, here, is right 
in the middle of the vertical axis, whereby the erotic connotation is impossible to deny. Everything revolves around pleasure and lust, by which men especially are so easily enticed. The tension between the boisterous company and the disciplined, critical painters is here amplified to a maximum. She is a wise woman. The others abandon themselves to pleasure. As opposed to the craving for excess, Michalina Bocci incarnates restraint. Nature and culture meet. The men allow themselves to be carried away by the procession. Michalina stands still. The mythological figures are set in a timeless virtual space. By gazing out of the painting, Michalina is seeking a connection with contemporary reality. In every triumphal procession of Bacchus, the god of wine is surrounded by followers. Women, too, are always part of this retinue. They can be recognized by their ketons and the terses, a staff wound with grapevines, and are subject of Bacchus. Minots fall into a state of ecstasy and intoxication and forget their duties as wives and mothers. By turning her head away from the god of wine, Michalina signals that she can withdraw from this sphere of influence and elude his disorderly intentions. It is inconceivable that Leopold Wilhelm, the Archduke, could ever have anticipated that this commission for a triumph of Bacchus would turn out as a triumph of Michalina Bocce, that shifted in an unsurpassed manner from self-experience to self-representation. The subtlety of her message was nevertheless understood by her patron and his milieu. Had it not been, the monumental canvas would never have traveled to Vienna. The pious archduke must have had a sense of humor and was also fond of plays with mythological themes. I'll just show you to compare some examples of dancing figures at the court of Louis XIV, who was a source of inspiration for the Archduke. Let us now return to some kind of a conclusion. Michalina can easily stand comparison with an Italian Baroque artist such as Artemisia Gentileschi. Moreover, no other woman artist from the early modern period was as original and versatile as Michalina was. The last thing the Archduke could have predicted is that it would take almost four centuries before others also discovered her genius. It is no how the monumental painting of the Triumph of Bacchus was moved from Brussels to Vienna in order to be recognized as an exceptional painting by an exceptional woman. The exhibition of 2018 let her re-enter the official scene. We do not know how this triumph of Bacchus, this huge painting, was brought from Brussels to Vienna in the 17th century. I suppose it must have been rolled up. But we know how complex it has been to bring the canvas back from Vienna to the Netherlands. Here you see this huge painting taken away from the Constitutious Museum of Brussels in order to bring it to Antwerp. It was packed in a wooden, some kind of uh, a chest, and there was even needed um, a crane to have it placed on the second floor. Now coming to the end, be sure. We were already looking at the exterior of the mass museum in which the exhibition 
was held in 2018. In the exhibition, the bust of the Archduke, a bronze bust as you can see here, guarded the huge painting of the triumph of Bacchus. In addition, not one of the shopping pedestrians of the city of Antwerp could pass there without having a face-to-face -face meeting with a formerly neglected woman artist. On the 12th of June, 2019, the Today's Google banner celebrated the Belgian artist Michalina Wautier. About four and a half million people saw her appear before their eyes when they opened their computer. I'm sure she will never vanish again. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>